Okay everyone, here we are in Los Angeles visiting a very famous music repair shop called Rosen Sound. Rob Rosen is the owner and founder, so I'm gonna come in here and there is Rob, Rob Rosen from Rosen Sound here. And look at this place, we're just coming in the door. My God. My shop of nightmares. <laughs> this is like synth heaven in here. Or limbo. Or limbo. And what? We have a GX1 in the corner. <laughs> oh my, what? This is super amazing. Can you tell me the history of the store? I mean, or of the shop, I should say. This is not even a store. This is, this is like vintage synth repairs and, and technicians and guys working in the back there. So love to learn a bit more about the shop. Sure, what, uh, what do you want to know? How did it all start? How did you get involved in all this? I got involved in keyboard repair in general at the young age of 14 or 15 years old. A high school dropout just seemed like the only thing I could really get a hang of. <laughs> okay. And I uh, used to do that in my parents' garage and it permeated into working with some high level artists from there and then when I lost my job at 21, I uh, decided to just open a business doing it full time. Very See nice. See how it went. So it's been going for many, many years now? Yes, we originally had our <clears throat> space next door, which is much smaller than this, considerably smaller. Mm -hmm. um, then expanded into the space next door to that which was much bigger, but filled up immediately. And now we have these four spaces now and almost a whole block. <laughs> cool. So uh, obviously you decided to focus on synths. What, yes. why, why synthesizers in particular? Like what attracted you to, this, to synths in general? What, uh, what caused me to only work on analog synths is because uh, it was the only subset of keyboard work where you could work with people who appreciated what you did. Interesting. Yes. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what did you say your first synth was then? Uh, in, what, in what regard? In like, well, either both owning and repairing, let's say. My first synth that I owned was a Prophet 5 that was given to me that's actually sitting over there just as a placeholder Okay. Uh, for some other Prophets we have in stock. Um, and then after that I got an OB-8. Uh, that's actually just as far as vintage analog goes. My first keyboard was actually a Korg Triton. Really? Yep. So um, tell me about sort of the process here with the repairs. Um, people obviously contact you from all over. Mm -hmm. um, is it national service only, international service? Oh, we do plenty of international. There are many things here that have come from out of the country, um, but of course mostly here in Los Angeles and uh, many things that come from within uh, the continental United States. Okay. Uh, we didn't have some things, I think, as far as Japan right now. Wow. Um, I'm trying to think what other countries are involved. We had some stuff from Ecuador recently. Um, but yeah, mostly, uh, mostly stuff from Japan from one guy right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is it mostly just, um, you know, keyboards or do you do modular stuff as well? Uh, we have done modulars in the past, uh, mostly, uh, well, I don't want to say mostly, but we just got done earlier last year doing a gigantic five panel portable Moog modular, vintage Moog, which was quite a sight. So. Yeah. No kidding, man. It's on our front page on our website on top of the GX1. <laughs> All right. And speaking of the GX1, what is the story? Um, There's got to be a story. I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to name the owner. Uh, that I don't feel like that'd be in good taste. But, okay. Uh, it was a lifelong dream of his to own one, mm -hmm. and he was lucky enough to be able to source one uh, and go on an expedition to Japan to find it. It actually still has the boat tag on the back. Really? And it got floated over here uh, along with its two gigantic speakers sitting over there. Oh yeah, look at that. The speakers in the corner here. Yeah. How much do these things weigh? Um, all together with the mechanical chair and the pedals, it weighs uh, um, a ton, literal ton. Really? Yes. Oh my god. It takes a lot of manpower to move this. Yes, it took six people to get the keyboard in here. Wow. Um, so, I mean, you've seen all types of synths, obviously, over the years. Of course. Um, what would you say is potentially your most difficult repair, let's say? Um, has there been anything that's been very particularly challenging? Um, CS80 or something like that. I've of course had many CS80s that have been very difficult to work on, um, though none have trumped me yet. Um, I'm trying to think of what the most difficult repair I've ever done is. Um, actually, we have an interesting four voice over here. Mm -hmm. if you want to follow me to the shop. This is the shop back here. This four voice, which is almost completed, uh -huh. um, this was an interesting repair because 
the actual chemistry going on <laughs> in the programmer because of the way it was stored yeah. actually caused the the layer of solder between the actual trace and the solder work to actually have develop like a layer under it so you could literally pull the chips out with no effort whatsoever and it wouldn't rip any traces so nothing was even connected and the whole thing needed to be completely rebuilt from the ground up wow. to ever work again and now it works it just needs some uh, cosmetic work right and some modifications before it's ready to go back this actually belongs to um the kid who actually works for tom oberheim as his demonstrator and tom awesome signed it for him oh that's so cool. so nice beautiful um and i see here there's actually a cs80 with the hood open yes cs80 right over here this belongs to a great guy named anthony marinelli from music forever um and uh it's a total train wreck but it's getting closer and closer to completion every day <laughs> oh my god and uh, he is very eager to get it back these voice cards yeah these are the m boards out right here or one m board out um, that host all your circuitry. Uh, normally when we're working on it, we'd have an insulating layer because this cannot be touching all this metal stuff here. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the card that has the first chain of power going into it. So we're just sprucing up some solder there and uh, checking these out to make sure everything's working correctly. So in general, like, because they do have a history of being sort of unstable at times. Sure. Is it mostly due to heat uh, or what? Um, it's mostly due to poor original servicing. I find that most synths that people claim are very unstable are actually very stable if as long as they've been fixed correctly, including this and the uh, memory mode that my right hand guy Mike is working on. Um, and um, you know, Prophet 5s, OBX, they all work just brilliantly as long as they've been serviced correctly. Okay, great. This is uh, quite something to see. I've never actually seen the inside of one of these, so. Oh, yeah, and then there's it's... also, let's see if I can give you a little more juice here. Just ignore that thing I just dropped. Mm -hmm. We can actually tilt this back. If I can get there. Challenging there. Yes, especially when you're on camera. Oh. <laughs> Don't this worry. Before I destroy this, and then you have a whole oh my God. world of <laughs> circuitry under the keys as well. Wow! This is where all the um, digital allocation of voices happen for the poly after touch and velocity um, that give the CS80 its dynamic abilities that are not found in any other synth mm -hmm. besides the T8, I suppose. Right. Polyphonic uh, keyboards are seem to be quite rare these days. Yes. Or polyphonic aftertouch keyboards, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, out of, you know, you've obviously tried a lot of sense. Do you have a favorite? Yes. What would it be? Four voice. The four voice. <laughs> or even more so the eight voice. Right. Yeah. Which is also exceptionally rare, it seems. Yeah, we actually do have two eight voices here now. There's the four voice cabinet there, still torn apart for repair work, with the four voice expansion sitting over here. Wow. So everything on this rack is currently being worked on? Yes. Okay. And uh, there's obviously tons of stuff. And there's even more over there. <laughs> oh my god. That's the main stuff. Stuff in the corner here. Can you uh, check this out? Sure, absolutely. You liking this? So you... Profit five here, under the scope, I guess, worrying to be worked on? Yeah, it's uh, just having some little tuning issues, so we're just solving those. Hmm. Okay, there's definitely a lot of gear back here. Pumps. Jupiter 8s. What, what is the common one that you see m most often? Um, we're fortunate enough to mostly see the... The stuff worth seeing. <laughs> yeah. So lots of Jupiter 8s. I think we probably, at the end of the day, have four or five of them here, including my own. Um, a couple of Jupiter 6s, <laughs> lots of OBXAs, OBX. Uh, I think we have two or three complete Chroma systems here, about five or six 2600s, five or six CS80s, um, a handful of Mini Moogs, etc. Right. So up there we got an ARP Quadra that you're pointing at right now. Yep a pretty rare one that's undergoing a full restore okay so yeah I mean this is something else I've never seen this many since in one place yeah, to, to be honest. Waldorf wave in here 
and uh, a big extended range Waldorf wave over here that belongs to Mark Isham. Wow. In a very rare color scheme as well. Yeah, these... Though they're rare to begin with, I think. Some say there's less than 100. Yeah. Um, what's the issue with these that seems to need repair? Uh, the power supply is not great. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, um, the gas struts go bad all the time and they just fall down all the time. But otherwise, they're you know because it's digital wavetables there's not that much that can really go wrong with it besides the hardware yeah um these pots are really weak they break all the time okay um but you know there's not a whole lot of them out there so most people are pretty careful with them yeah this was like a feat of engineering or something at the yes. time you know like this is just massive a lot of people come in here hoping to buy a ppg and i tell them to forget it and try to find one of these instead <laughs> <laughs> i'd rather have this by a mile <laughs> That's incredible. Or a kilometer, depending on where you're from. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so, do you make, I gotta ask this, do you make music yourself? Yes, of course. I actually make uh, melodic death metal music. Really? Yes. That's, That's awesome. Are you... Scandinavian uh, melodic death metal is what got me into keyboards and synthesizers to begin with. Okay. Even though usually they use digital crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So are you playing keys in that band? or? I, I do play keys in a metal band, though we're not doing much right now, mostly because I'm too busy. Yeah, working the shop. Um, and what would you say is sort of next for the business? Are you planning to expand again? Um, um, <laughs> if I say yes and my wife sees this, she'll kill me. Um, no more space expansions for now, okay. um, but we're definitely going to be going into manufacturing. Um, we've already started some basic manufacturing with um, some new circuit boards and things mm -hmm. uh, for older synths, um, and we plan to continue to develop on that. You mentioned earlier um, off-camera uh, custom, custom work. Yeah. Um, so what kind of custom work do you do? I think I saw a chrome. Yeah, something. I can show you the chrome odyssey though. That's kind of, you know, an ARP odyssey is not exactly the most exciting thing in the world to customize. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a nice experiment because we really wanted to see how white text would look on chrome gear when we were doing Chromeo's live rig. You're Canadian, so you must know Chromeo. Yeah? Exactly. Um, For sure. Yeah. So we did their whole live rig in chrome, uh, which was absolutely ridiculously stupid, uh, but in a good way. Um, we threw this Odyssey in there to see how white silkscreen looks. So here we have a an original vintage ARP Odyssey in Chrome with white lettering. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we love doing custom work like this. But we just got done doing a uh, black on black Juno, one of six that turned out spectacular. I wish it was turning out for you to see. Right. And what do other um, types of custom work to have people requested? Modifications? Uh, tons of wood cabinets. Um, I mean, as far as custom work, it, I guess it kind of depends on what you mean, cosmetic work or uh, electronic work. Right. Electronic work is a lot easier because, you know, you just got to drill some holes and design some simple circuits, um, usually. Mm -hmm. um, but we do a lot of that. Um, you know, what, like I showed you the four voice over there is getting modularized. That's kind of a more common uh, custom thing that we would do. Uh, we've done tons of wood cabinets. I wish they were all here to show you, uh, but if you follow me next door to our very, very messy under construction workshop. Okay. In here is where we'll actually do uh, Tolex work and custom wood work. So, for example, up there you'll see a cabinet for a Korg 3100. Right. Um, if you go on Reverb at the time of this video, there's someone selling the actual custom walnut cabinet. Uh, with the synth, of course, mm -hmm. um, on there, but that's the original piece of crap cabinet that Corey released with it. Right. Um, so we'd use that to make a brand new one. Um, over here, you can see the remains of an ARP 2600 that's being re at the moment. That's the front of it, the part where the actual panel would sit in. And uh, yeah, it's just getting kind of a new lease on cosmetic life. Nice. And I see you also have some Electone organs. Uh, yeah, that actually uh, got dumped on us by a nice client of ours. <laughs> he wanted us to chop it, and then right when we were about to get started, he found a chopped one. So now it's just going to live here. It's going to live time. here. Okay. And then I have uh, my personal Hammond organ and Leslie, which we do not repair here, but I own um, anyway. I've heard um, that certain Electone organs have parts inside that are similar or can be similar to a CS80 or something like that? Yes, it's also kind of a myth. Uh, most of them use divide-down technology. They don't need to be tuned or anything. Right. Um, you know, that one does have a Yamaha VCO in it that you could pull for a CS80. Mm -hmm. um, but like the E70 is the most common one that people compare to a CS80. Um, and while they are close, they are certainly not that close. Right. <laughs> certainly not a replacement. Would you say that 
I mean, you were mostly working on vintage stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you ever repair more modern? Yeah, uh, sometimes. Depends on the person and depends on the budget. Uh, because, of course, most people who have new things are expect a warranty. We do not do warranty work, though we do. That's a lie because we do do warranty work for Tom Oberheim. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, we will repair newer gear as long as you ask very nicely and are patient. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, and related to that, I mean, would you say the newer stuff is getting easier to repair or? Uh, that depends solely on the company who made it and their uh, willingness and ability to support. Uh, I'll give a kudos to uh, Dave Smith. Their team is excellent. Mm -hmm. um, whenever we have a Dave Smith instrument here, or I guess sequential now and it breaks down, we can email them and they are so quick to send us parts uh, and offer advice to get it up and running again. Awesome. Um, and I mean, in general, since you're based in LA, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of musicians here for sure. Tons. Uh, what's the sort of electronic music scene with since in the, in the area like? Oh man. I mean, a lot of that's really based on your rack nowadays, okay. uh, which I'm not into. <laughs> um, so I'm not really so in the loop on that. I wish I could answer that question. Mm. Better. Okay. No worries. Just curious. Um, all right. Well, this is awesome. I mean, this is the workshop here. Yeah, so this will be soon, probably the next time you come around here, this will be a full uh, wood shop and uh, telexing room. That will be a spray room, not just a uh, place where I store my speakers while we remodel our, <laughs> what we call the cabin. Right. Over here. Oh, the cabin. Yes. This is the cabin here? Yes, the reverberous room over the, there. It's quite cavernous. <laughs> yeah, that'll be, uh, yeah, we can flooring down after the weekend. Right. Uh, getting some stands on the wall and getting it treated and it'll be ready to go. But it'll be a pretty large room when you consider it will just be filled with vintage scents to rent for today. Right. So um, actually that was something that I noticed on your website. I, yeah. I know it's not currently uh, available, but um, what is the cabin? It's um, a studio, a music studio where people can come in. And, yeah, it's and... a music studio based around vintage scents um, and uh, sequencers, I guess. Though we will be having many modern sequencers and drum machines. Um, and it'll be available to rent by the day for local musicians or traveling musicians. Um, and of course, just to do gear demos of things that we have for rental or people who just want to try something really bad because not everyone, you can't exactly walk to a guitar center to play Jupiter 8. No. But if you ask nicely and you want to come here and try one, it's fine with me. Right on, man. Okay, well, let's uh, just go back to this room for a sure. minute. Yeah, this room's ugly as hell. <laughs> Check out what's out yeah. here. So, uh, how many people work here? I mean, you've got a lot of employees already yeah. working on, on yeah, stuff here. Uh, there are quite a few people working here. Um, I don't know how badly they want to be on camera. <laughs> so no. I won't uh, test them for an uh, interview or anything, but I got my main guy, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, Eli, who's sort of my partner in the cabin. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean he uh, is just the guy who goes in there and actually makes music in it. Um, then there's uh, Spencer, my left hand guy. Uh, who mostly does Juno L sixes and Prophet fives here, and Caesar, our wonderful intern, he is uh, doing mostly mass rebuilds and recaps of certain gear. Cool, that's amazing. Mostly stuff that we're selling. Yeah, no, for sure. And you do have a shop uh, where people can buy. Yeah, uh, so everything out here uh, is for sale. Okay. Um, there is more than just this, unfortunately, elsewhere, um, at home mostly. But um, I am an avid buyer and collector of gear, and uh, I'm happy to sell it <laughs> as well. So what do we have for sale right now? We've got a Profit T8. Yes, Profit T8, fully restored. Everything here is fully restored and ready to go. Uh, you've got you know, this beautiful Profit T8. Mm -hmm. There's my son screaming. <laughs> uh, PPG Wave. Um, Poly 6. Yeah. Uh, we have two Jupiter 8s available at the moment, uh, and that's the one that's just sitting there. We have three Profit 5s at the moment, but since the studio is under construction, I have mine out here as a placeholder. Okay. Um, we always have 106s in stock. Um, we religiously sell them uh, because we believe that should be everyone's first cent instead of a DX7. So we keep <laughs> a lot of them in stock. Fair enough. There's also a Profit 10 here. Wow. Yes. This, this is, is actually my Profit 10 in place of a Profit 10 that we have in route to us now. Okay. Um, this is my second favorite instrument I have. What uh, what do you like so much about it? I'm curious. Um, it's two private fives in one box. Uh, no one can argue that it is literally that. Uh, it does have a couple extra features that are really nice, but otherwise uh, it's a lot more expressive with the pedal inputs and the cross modulation with that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, profit fives are cool. You know, they were one, the first of its kind essentially. 
They're a bit cheesy, but you know what? When you put two in one box with the multi-layering and everything, it really comes alive. Yeah. To just be a super amazing instrument. It's definitely a large beast. Yes, it's also quite big. <laughs> yeah, physically as yeah. well as uh, sonically. Um, there's some sort of was this electro comp stuff? Yes, yeah, EML 101. A very early revision of it. It's a fun little modular thing. Nice. Funny modular, I guess. Oh yeah, there's a Kawhi K3 in the corner there. Yeah, just, you know, sometimes we get some cheap stuff. <laughs> yeah, I've got one of those. They're pretty cool. Yeah, they're cool. They're fun. Um, Oberheim OBX. Yes, a big fan of the OBXs. I've uh, been lucky enough to purchase a lot of them over the last couple of years and been happy to sell them. Um, this is a really good one that we're uh, helping a client sell. Mm -hmm. It just needs a MIDI kit and it's ready to go. JX3P. Oh, it looks, there's a DeepMind 12. Yeah, it's a DeepMind that was actually given to me by Behringer. Um, but I have some philosophical differences with them now that I have no desire to continue to have it. <laughs> so much so that if you spend enough money, I'll just give it to you. <laughs> All right, good to know. Uh, I see here as well, there's some more Oberheim, OBXA. Yeah, I'm a big Oberheim fan. <laughs> The first thing I search every morning. Awesome. Um, and then there's a Jupiter 4. Yes. It's a beautiful Some instrument. CV gate, mod, CV gate mods on it. Mm -hmm. SH5. Yes. It's a lovely mono. Great filter. Great oscillators. Um, and then here's the Prophet 5s. These are two Prophet 5 Rev 1s, actually. Really? So these, are, uh, these were made by Dave Smith in his garage. This one on top is a bit uh, later as far as Rev 1s are concerned. This one's basically a Rev 2. Uh -huh. But this one is actually number 14. Wow. So you can imagine this is extremely yeah. haphazard inside. Curious, so like... Truly the work of a mad genius. And sonically, like, these early versions versus something much later, um, how do you find the character? They're different. They're definitely different. Uh, I don't buy into the Rev 2, <clears throat> Rev 3 debate hype. Uh, I think they both sound wonderful and similar enough where it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, but they do surely sound different and good. Fair enough. <laughs> They're both great. I like. I love the uh, the wood paneling though. Look at this yeah, marble it's a wood uh, against the uh, later walnut that you see on the Rev Three over there. Right. Though after getting this Rev One I, and seeing as how late this Rev One is, I actually think this may be a walnut cabinet, and this would be a koa. Right. The koa that they're known for. Right. Uh, that's something else. And then uh, wave term here on that's the left. That's not for sale. That actually belongs to Junkie XL. It's just sitting out here because there's nowhere really? to put it. That's awesome. Tom's wave term. It's amazing. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, um, this is quite the shop. Uh, you know, I guess where my last question would be: Where can people find you online? <laughs> Um, or, you know, if they happen to be in L.A. or... If you happen to be in L.A., just give us a call before you come by. Uh, that's all we ask. Uh, we're trying to keep a tight schedule here when we can. Mm -hmm. And the uh, walk-ins can sometimes be uh, problematic. Uh, but, you know, just call us ahead. You can find us at rosensound.com or on Instagram. Uh, of course, just under rosen underscore sound, I think. Not okay. rosen sound in one thing. You'll find it. Yeah. Um, and that's about it. We're on Facebook too, but it's just a duplication of our Instagram anyway. Got it. Okay. Well, Rob, thank you so much for this tour of Rosen thank Sound. Thank you so much, man. It's great <laughs> to come by and meet you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care. You too. All right. Guys, that'll wrap up this little studio tour of this amazing place. So, Rosen Sound is your place. Uh, you know, if you need to get something repaired, uh, vintage synths, uh, this is the place to go. So, make sure you check it out. Uh, whether you're based in the U.S. or internationally. See you next time.